All right, so uh, in this video, we will start a uh, new lab. This is the phishing websites lab. Okay, so uh, in this video, I'm really just going to focus on the features. So at this point, you know, if you're following the sequence of the course, uh, you've done several of the labs, the IoT, malware, uh, IDS. And so, you know, this one is just a little bit different um, and it has to do with a different kind of an attack, so the phishing websites, right? So we all know what phishing attacks are, you know, when people send you an email and the email has some link that they want you to click on, or you open a website and the website actually redirects you to another page, which might be trying to steal your information. So in this video, um, we will focus on phishing websites Right, um, and this paper is basically about the features that you could use. All right, uh, so we want to get a sense of how that works, and then after that, we will, uh, in other videos, we will take the the actual data set and um, you know do the machine learning analysis. So this uh, work was done uh, by Lee McCluskey and his and his team at the University of Huddersfield in the UK. All right, so. Uh, Definitely in the website of this course and in the uh, lab descriptions, we will provide a link to this paper. I, I, I strongly recommend that you read it, given that I'm not going to describe all the features. There's a lot of features, uh, but I'll basically you know, kind of go over them. And there are three categories, if you will, uh, for phishing websites here. The, they basically, because they have to do with the web and, you know, going from one website to another website, they really um, focus on three categories, which are, are to analyze the URL itself, uh, to analyze the code, the, the HTML code, and in, the included JavaScript that's there, and then maybe to include some metadata or some additional uh, information about you know, the website, such as like the certificates and things like that. All right, so uh, here, you know, they basically, in the paper, I'm not going to read the paper, but they, um, they basically here kind of uh, provide an argument as to the challenges of features, that, that there's no actual set of features. Um, you know, there's been plenty of articles, as they describe, about predicting phishing websites using data mining techniques that have been disseminated, but there is no reliable training data set, right, as of yet. So we are using their publicly available uh, data set. Uh, and so this, here they provide, you know, just a list of the features that they have used and how they work. So in this article, they shed light on the important features that have proved to be sound and effective in predicting phishing websites. All right, and they also propose some new features that they have used for their work. So uh, I will go over uh, the, the features that they provide here. And they have actually a very nice, uh, they, they've summarized kind of the description with a little if statement rule. So they, their code basically for feature extraction includes heuristic rules on how to take, you know, they, you know, they download the website, they have the URL, and then, uh, you know, their, their code basically looks at the URL, looks at the code, and then it creates their, their feature vectors, basically. So the first one that they look at is uh, using the IP address, they say. So if an IP address is used as an alternative of the domain name in the URL, such as this one, so you can see here, the HTTP includes an IP address, then, you know, that could be considered phishing. So remember that these are not rules to determine if a website is phishing or not, right? So these are just features that they are extracting. The machine learning algorithm still needs to learn, you know, if it's supervised learning based on the labels, right, which features have a contribution. So just here what they're saying is basically we're going to include as a feature to be analyzed, you know, uh, if the IP address is uh, included instead of the domain name. Now they also say that sometimes the IP address is even transformed into hexadecimal code as shown in the following link, and you can see that there. So basically the rule is, you know, if, you know, let's say this is gonna be F1 of your feature vector, 
right? And for that given website, so you're going to say if the domain part has an IP address, then you know it's phishing. Therefore, what they might say is you know this is a one instead of a zero, right? It's a one instead of a zero, but you still have, as I said, you're only creating the feature vector. You still need to figure out the class. So it might turn out that you know it does include the you know the the feature does include or you know the IP address but the class is still zero right so that's important to remember that it's still up to the algorithm to determine if those features are actually a contribution to the classification or not all right so that's um, the first example let's look at the next one all right so uh, this one's pretty straightforward. So they argue if it's a, if it has a long URL to hide the suspicious part, then it's probably phishing. So here you can see an example of a long URL. So that's really long, right? So phishers can use long URLs to hide the doubtful part in the address part, all right? And so they actually came up with a rule down here. You can see it. So they say if the URL length uh, is less than 54 it's probably legitimate so the feature here let's say this is f2 would be so here they have legitimate suspicious or phishing so it might be you know minus one zero and one so in this case if this is minus or this is plus one zero and minus one then you would categorize this feature if it's long as minus one right so that would be the the feature entry all right, uh, the next one, let's look at the next one here. All right, so the next one is using URL shortening services such as tiny URL. So URL shortening is a method in the World Wide Web in which URL may be considerably smaller in length and still lead to the required web page. All right, so this is the example you have here. It's so basically, this is accomplished by means of a redirect and all right, and you can see that, for example, here you have uh, that the you know the UK their university's uh, website can be shortened to this format over here, right? And and I think we've all seen this, um, you know, whenever we're using the internet or receive emails, we've seen this this kind of thing. So again, they're not saying that this is necessarily a phishing website. They're just saying this is a suspicious thing and so they mark that in their feature set. So if it has a tiny URL, it could be phishing. So mark the feature as such. Otherwise mark it as legitimate and let the machine learning figure it out. All right, the next one, URLs that have an at symbol. So basically if the URL has an at symbol, they are gonna note it. Uh, so Using an at symbol in the URL leads the browser to ignore everything preceding the at symbol. And the real address often follows the at symbol. And so those are little tricks that, you know, by, by using the URL encoding, you can uh, obtain different kind of behavior. Redirecting using the two forward slashes, all right? So that's another one that they've considered here as a feature. So the existence of forward slashes within a URL path means that the user will be redirected to another website. An example of this is something like this. So you have legitimate website and then followed by redirections here to phishing website. So they examine the location where the redirects appears and they found that if the URL starts with HTTP, that means the two forward slashes should appear in the sixth position. However, if the URL employs HTTPS, then it should appear in the seventh position. So basically they're saying, if the, so their rule for the feature is, if the position of the last occurrence of the two forward slashes in the URL is greater than position seven, then it might be phishing. So they're gonna mark it like that. And you can see at this point, this is the approach that they're taking for uh, extracting features from um, phishing websites. All right, so most of what we've looked at so far is related to the URL. All right, so they, they also, another suspicious feature might be when you have adding a prefix or suffix separated by a dash, right, to the domain. So you have 
something like this one. So the dash symbol is rarely used in legitimate URLs, and fishers tend to add prefixes or suffixes separated by the dash to the domain so that the user feels that they are dealing with a legitimate website. So this is another feature that they might use here. The next group is uh, if they have a lot of subdomains or multi-subdomains. Multi All right, so let us assume we have the following. So here they, they state, let us assume we have the following link. So you can see that here. A domain name might include the country code, top level domains, right? Which in this example would be the UK, then they have the AC part, which is shorthand for academic. So that combined AC.UK is called the second level domain. And the HUD is the actual domain itself. So to produce a rule for extracting this feature, uh, first they omit the WW part of the URL, which is in fact a subdomain in itself, and then they remove the top level domains if they exist. And finally what they do is they count the number of dots. All right, so you can see that it's kind of like they're just leaving the dots in there. And if the number of dots is greater than one, then the URL is classified as suspicious. So here you could probably play around with this. If there's a lot of subdomains, more than two, three, four, you'd have more dots. And so by having more dots, they basically you know, might mark it as suspicious. All right, so you can see that. So if there's one, two, or more otherwise, then it's definitely phishing for the feature itself, okay? All right, this one is more about uh, the certificate, so not, not necessarily so much about the URL. So you can see here, the existence of HTTPS is very important in, in giving the impression of a website's legitimacy, as we all know. But this is clearly not enough. So they read in several other papers that they should check the certificate assigned with HTTPS, including the extent of the trust certificate issuer. Right, so if it's Verizon, Ver, Ver, sorry, Ver, VeriSign, one of those companies, and the certificate age. So basically, this is one of those metadata features, right? So now they're looking at the certificate itself. If, if the URL has HTTPS, they're checking the issuer, the certificate age. Um, if it's among the top you know, five trustworthy companies, GeoTrust, GoDaddy, Network Solutions, you know, and so on, VeriSign, and so on. All right, and so this is, as I said, this is another example of the features that they extract, uh, and it, it kind of makes sense. All right, and so you can see their rule here is use if the URL uses HTTPS and the issuer is trusted, which basically means it's in that list, and the age of the certificate is greater than one year, it's probably legitimate. Everything else, it should be marked as a something else. This, this one is similar, domain registration length. All right, so if the domain, um, you know, obviously phishing websites are, are going to be short-lived, uh, so you know, a trustworthy domain is a domain that has been around for several years. So basically here you can see this feature is if the domain expires on, um, you know, in, in a year or less, right? So it might be phishing, All right? All right, this is an example of when things are being loaded from a different source. So a favicon, this is another type of thing that you might find on a website, is a graphic image icon associated with a specific website. Many existing user agents, such as graphical browsers and news readers, show favicons you know, as visual reminders of the website's identity in the address bar. If the favicon is loaded from a domain other than that's shown in the address bar, then the web page could is likely to be considered a phishing attempt. So that's pretty straightforward. And a lot of these rules are actually very straightforward. Um, you know, just like that. Then another one that's you know it, that's important is just you know 
what port number they're using. So if you find port numbers on the URL, are they standard port numbers or not? So this feature is use, useful in validating if a particular service, such as HTTP, HTTP, is up or down on a specific server. All right, so you can see here, they're looking at the very you know, specific you know, HTTPS, port 80, et cetera. Right? So this information certainly is useful, at least having a feature that if the, you know, is the port number present, what it is, and so on. Remember that it's important to say here that, again, I'll remind you that, you know, it's perfectly valid to have a port number on the URL, uh, that, that's fine, but here we're not saying that the presence of that, URL, that port number is, it means that it's absolutely a phishing website, it just means that that's one of the features you want to capture. At the end of the day, when you do the feature ranking, it might turn out that the port number is not necessarily contributing a lot for instance. So that can happen as well. All right, uh, another one is the existence of HTTP of the HTTPS token in the domain part of the URL. So you can see that here in this example, the website starts with HTTP, but then they added the HTTPS probably to trick the user. So fishers may add the HTTPS token to the domain part of the URL in order to trick users. For example, that. So here they're saying using HTTP token in the domain part of the URL as well as HTTPS, let's say. Right? So that could be their feature there. All right, so this one's uh, simple enough. Uh, again, this one has to do with bringing information from the outside. So a request URL. So request URL examines whether the external, this feature, ex examines whether the external objects contained within a web page, such as images, videos, sounds, are loaded from another domain. All right, so usually you, you, know, you would want them to be loaded from the same domain. So in legitimate web pages, the web page address and most objects embedded within the web page are sharing the same domain. So this is something that you want to uh, do. And they have some statistics here, right? So they probably, what they do is they, they look at the, so this is one where they look at the entire code. They look at the entire code. So here they look at the entire code. And so the idea is um, they look at all the URL requests, right? So every time you stay, see like an anchor tag or something like that, um, and then they count all of them, right? And they, they count like the statistics of how many of those links in the website, website go to the, the same domain of the website and how many don't, right? So by, you know, they, they basically create it like a, like a range. So if it's less than, 22% that go outside, then it's legitimate. If it's between 22 and 61, it's suspicious. If it's more than that, you know, most of it is going outside of the domain, then that might be a phishing. So they mark it as such, all right? This one is similar. So an anchor, you know, as we know, an anchor, the anchor tag is uh, an element in a website and this feature is treated exactly as request URL, right? So the same idea, they just look at specific anchor tags, okay? Uh, they also look at links such as meta, script, and link here. So here they're saying, uh, given their investigation, or that are, their investigation covers all angles likely to be used in web page source code, they found that it is common for legitimate websites to use meta tags to offer metadata about the document. Script tags to create client scripts and links to retrieve web sources. It is expected that these tags are linked to the same domain of the web page. So again, this one is very similar. A lot of these features are very similar to the, that previous one of checking the domain. They're just looking at different tags in the website. The last interesting set of features that I'm going to discuss here for, the, for this lab on phishing websites 
is these domain-based features. So these are actually kind of interesting. So we'll go over them. Um, so as you can see, you know, they here they'll basically look at statistics from other databases about that website in question. So that you know, take that URL and then look it up on for DNS records for their statistics about page rank, website traffic, and age of the domain. So here you can see, for instance, in, the, in this one kind of self-explanatory age of the domain, this feature can be extracted from the Whois database. Uh, most phishing websites live for a short period of time. By reviewing our data set, the, the authors found that the minimum age of, the, of legitimate domains is six months. So, you know, basically they came up with this rule for the feature that if the age of the domain is greater than or equal to six months, then you mark it as, you know, one, otherwise you mark it as two. All right. The next one is the DNS record. So uh, here, if there's no DNS record for the domain, then it's probably efficient. So you want to look, look that up as well in some way. The next statistic they want to look at is website traffic. Okay, website traffic. So this feature measures the popularity of the website by determining the number of visitors and the number of pages they visit. Uh, however, since phishing websites live for a short period of, period of time, they may not be recognized by the Alexa database. So this is the Alexa, um, you know, database basically. Alexa, the web information company, 1996. By reviewing our, uh, this data set, the authors found that in worst scenarios, legitimate websites ranked among the top 100,000. Furthermore, if the domain has no traffic or is not recognized by the Alexa database, it is classified as phishing. So you can see here the rule is, you know, website ranked less than 100,000, probably legitimate, otherwise market as potentially suspicious. All right. So as you can see, these are all, you know, this required, these uh, features require the use of external databases. Here we have another example, PageRank. Uh, if you've studied information retrieval, you, you've probably heard of this. Uh, I assume the thing that Larry Page and Sergey Brin developed for Google. So PageRank is a value ranging from zero to one, right? So PageRank aims to measure how important a web page is on the internet. The greater the page rank value, the more important the web page. With, when they did, the authors here, did their analysis of the data sets, they found that about 95% of phishing web pages have no page rank. And they found that the remaining 5% of phishing web pages may reach a page rank value of up to 0 0.2. So as you can see then, Based on that, they came up with this, feat, this uh, heuristic rule for the feature extraction. So if the page rank less than 0 0.2, then it's probably efficient. So they marked that there. We're almost done with the features, just a few more. Uh, there's also Google Index. You can see at this point, the logic is very similar. Uh, so Google Index, this feature examines whether a website is on Google's index or not. So if the web page is indexed by Google, then legitimate, otherwise not. This one also is very similar. The number of links pointing to the page. So the number of links pointing to the web page indicates its legitim legitimacy level, even if some links are of the same domain. So in, in their data set, and due to its short lifespan, they found that 98% of phishing data of the phishing data set items have no links pointing to them. All right. On the other hand, legitimate websites have at least two external links pointing to them, and so you can see here the rule is. Oops. So the rule here is, um, if the number of links pointing to the web page is equal to zero, it's probably phishing. Between zero and two, is suspicious. Otherwise is legitimate. All right, and that's basically it. Um, you, can, you can imagine, I'll let you read the rest of the features, but they're all pretty consistent. So in summary, what, you know, what did we see about uh, this lab? 
this is trying to determine phishing website features, whether you receive an email, you know, when, when you receive an email, what they want you to do is click on that link and it takes you to some website, right? So uh, really what you want to analyze there is those websites. So the features that they looked at were the URL itself, right? The code and basically things about uh, the database. So kind of here I can illustrate three broad categories of features features, right, we're three broad categories, URL itself, URL, the website code, so the website code, and then the database related, so let's just say database lookup. Right, and so these are really the, the, the three types of features that have been instract, extracted. So the code is pretty straightforward for a lot of these. You know, you write some Python code to look for, um, you know, as, as the if statements indicated. So if, you know, at symbol in URL, right? So that would be the type of code you have to write there. The, kind of the same for the code, you're looking for specific tags. So um, now a good, now this requires the use of a library. So one library that I would recommend in Python for website processing and extracting information from websites is something called Beautiful Soup. So Beautiful Soup. Right, so this is a library in Python. You might want to look it up. Um, I would recommend for you know downloading websites. So you know whenever you have a list of you you know phishing attacks or attempts, you know you get the email, you get the URL, and then with Beautiful Soup you can download the website itself. Uh, you can get the URL, you can get the code, and then run the code. And then also you'd need to look up something have some code for to look up the databases, extract the information. But overall, this is pretty straightforward to do. Uh, if you're an instructor, I would recommend that you have your students develop this as a lab. Um, it would basically be, you know, you can use our data set, kind of extract a few of the URLs in there, or the, the data set, not our data set, but the data set that we're using in this class is actually from this group right, from University of Huddersfield, but you can use their data set to extract the URLs, to extract the URLs in a list, and then use something like Beautiful Soup to write the code that allows you to analyze the URLs, allows you to, do, to analyze the code and to do database lookups to convert every single one of those websites into their equivalent um, feature vectors. All right, so hopefully that uh, if that's a good introduction to uh, phishing website or phishing website, the phishing websites lab. All right, so in the next video, we will now assume we have the data set, we've taken all those URLs and websites, converted them into the feature vector space, and we are ready to do some machine learning.